We are in the middle of the SAG nominations voting period. I am joined by Luca Gilberti, Zach Laws, and Tony Ruiz. And I'm Riley Chow, and we are from Gold Derby, and we are going to be discussing what we are predicting for the SAG nominations in the film categories. So we are going to go category by category, but first I want to talk broadly about what we're looking for uh, that distinguishes SAG, the Screen Actors Guild, from other voting bodies. So, Zach, I noticed that you're predicting three Netflix films in Ensemble. Mm -hmm. You've got Dolomite Is My Name, Marriage Story, and The Irishman. So do you think that's betting a little too heavy on Netflix or not heavily enough? Uh, well, I mean, if there were more than just two popes, I would probably put the two popes in there as well and have four. Um, you know, if there's one thing that we've learned about SAG in a post-Netflix world, it's that uh sag really loves netflix i mean this is the group that gave an ensemble nomination to beasts of no nation which really only had three people in the cast um you know they gave an ensemble nomination to mudbound so clearly they love this studio um because of how easily accessible all of their titles are to the members and you know quite frankly because you know their titles are right up their alley right so if you look at the three films that i'm predicting marriage story irishman and dolomite is my name they each satisfy these different um things that sag loves right so marriage story is obviously an actor's movie right i mean it's it's all about the performances by Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson and Laura Dern and Alan Alda, all of whom I have getting in, by the way, spoiler alert, uh, and Ray Liotta and the kid and all, you know, Merritt Weaver on and on and on. Um, you look at the Irishman again, like all star cast people, uh, like De Niro, Pesci, Pacino, all of whom are probably going to get nominated. Uh, and then Dolomite is, you know, a crowd pleaser. Again, you've got people like, Eddie Murphy and Wesley Snipes in there. But you've also got diversity, right? Uh, SAG is not going to pick an all-white people lineup. Uh, they never do. Uh, and so I think that, you know, Dolomite is my name, a film like that, or a film like uh, The Farewell or Hustlers, things like that are going to be looked at because of uh, the diversity within the cast. So, I mean, that's why I have all three of those getting in. It just so happens that they all are, you know, on Netflix. Okay, so Tony, you're the only one of us who are predict who's predicting The Farewell and Parasite. So can you tell us why you're predicting those two and does it relate to how you make your, sad, uh, your SAG uh, predictions on a broad level? Well, one of the things that I, I, I you know, this is, SAG Ensemble, we do tend to look at this as you know, the ensemble category. And oftentimes, even films that are beloved, uh, there has to be that kind of ensemble feel. I think Beast of No Nation is a bit of an outlier. Um, <laughs> but when you look at, you know, two of the most acclaimed films, um, I think more in the case of Parasite than in The Farewell, these are films that, that, that really are true ensemble films. Um, and I think also we've seen, you know, the, the full Monty won this category. Sometimes the SAG likes to go for these smaller films that, you know, for some reason, just the ensemble nature of it kind of clicks. So um, I think Parasite for sure is is going to get into Best Picture at the Oscars. And so we also have to look at that, you know, what films do we think are getting Best Picture nominations that actually have a shot at winning? And I think uh, Parasite sure, certainly has a chance. And it is also an incredibly ensemble film there really isn't a lead in that movie um plus the fact that uh you know the farewell was just so beloved uh it's that kind of feel good wrap you in a hug movie that uh everybody loves and it's actually starting to get some awards traction particularly for uh the supporting actress whose name i cannot pronounce uh, you, Jen. <laughs> thank you um but uh i so i i think I haven't updated my predictions in a while, but I think Parasite actually has more of a shot here than The Farewell, but for right now, I'm just going to keep it as predicting them both. All right, and Luca, instead of The Farewell and Parasite, you've got Downton Abbey and Hustlers. So explain yeah. yourself. 
And, and explain well, it for me as well, because I'm predicting both those as well. It was a big shock to the system because we had these big box office successes such as, you know, Crazy Rich Asians and Black Panther, um, Bohemian Rhapsody. We just had these movies that made a ton of money at uh, the box office and were extremely popular get in. Whereas something, you know, critical favorites like Widows and The Favorite, which would be the typical SAG nominees, didn't make it in. And I think Hustlers just is that movie this year. It's a huge box, box office success. It came out in September. So we pro it's, you know, likely that voters have actually seen the movie and it has an all, you know, it's a, it's a big, huge female cast with Jennifer Lopez getting a bunch of buzz for her performance. And it just seems like such a typical SAG nominee to me. I'm going out on a limb for that one. I'm not, I don't feel confident about it at all, especially because I have something like the Irishman missing for it, which given their love for Netflix seems strange and the cast of the Irishman. But I think Hustlers is the typical movie that they would like to reward now. And Downton Abbey, well, they've loved it on the TV side time and again. They've rewarded it so many times now. And um, I think it, it'll be able to sneak in here as well. And it has both film and TV actors, of course, which is something very important to consider when we talk about the SAG Awards. The only concern I've heard, and I do agree with that concern, is that some voters may consider it more of a TV show, as a TV show, more so than a movie. But I think Maggie Smith will get in, and I think the ensemble will get in as well. Yeah, I pretty much agree with that. For me, when I'm making SAG predictions, I try to make my Oscar predictions first, and then I work backwards uh, based on mm -hmm. you know the w what distinguishes SAG from the Oscars. So I figured that the nominees are going to be more diverse. They're going to be uh, a bit more skewed toward crowd-pleasing films as opposed to art house films. And most importantly, I consider whether the SAG nominating committee has actually seen the film. Because SAG is voting very early. You know, they started voting on November 14th, but they are considering films that will be released through December 31st. So unlike a lot of other nominations that are coming out in January, these nominations will be out in December, and they're going to have to vote on movies that really... Like, nobody um, outside of the industry has seen at this point. So I'm looking at, you know, what films have been sent to voters at this point. Yeah. Uh, for example, Bombshell, you know, that seems like an acting showcase, but voters have not received uh, the film. And it's the same with Parasite. That one's out in theaters right now, but I don't think, you know, many people have seen it in theaters. And the SAG nominating committee hasn't actually received Parasite on DVD. Um, and then I don't have The Irishman because uh, that one seems just a little bit less accessible uh, than these other movies that I'm predicting, like Downton Abbey and Jojo Rabbit, which uh, none of you guys have. Uh, I mean, look at last year when we had The Favorite. The Favorite was widely seen. It still got three acting nominations. But there's just something a little bit off about it that held it back from being embraced by the masses, and it didn't get that ensemble nomination. Uh, and then one more thing I'll say is just that uh, we always call it ensemble, but that's more of a colloquialism uh, based on what the TV equivalent award is called. In the film category, it's actually just called cast. So sometimes you do see these films that only have three people in it uh, on the ballot, and then it's a bit more justifiable if you think about it that way. You know, uh, Luca, you talked about going out on a limb for Hustlers, and I actually am predicting Hustlers as well, um, right. <laughs> because, it, you know, it's it's a big box office smash, and it's a film that basically features uh, entirely women, and women of color, you know? Uh, I think that there's a lot of people in SAG who will want to embrace and, and prop that movie up, even if it doesn't necessarily... Uh, you know, every year there's some kind of a head scratcher inclusion in ensemble, you know, movies like Captain Fantastic or 310 to Yuma, things like that. So it's always really hard to pick what that's going to be. But I feel like, you know, Hustlers is gaining that kind of momentum at the right moment, even if it won't necessarily translate to the broader Oscar race. Mm -hmm. The film that I actually have winning right now that none of us have brought up yet is uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um you know, uh, 
Tarantino uh, and Glorious Bastards won this award. Uh, if they had had an ensemble prize in 1994 when they first handed out uh, SAG prizes, Pulp Fiction probably would have won that in a landslide. Um, you know, actors love Tarantino's movies. And, you know, this film is a big $100 million hit. It's basically got everybody uh, in Hollywood in it. You know, even the people who won't necessarily be uh, in consideration for ensemble, like um, I don't believe Kurt Russell um, is uh, is going to be on the ballot. But, you know, Goldie Hawn's going to vote for it. <laughs> and all the people who know Kurt Russell are going to vote for it. So, um, you know, I, I, I see that as kind of like your stealth uh, contender. And I will say this about, like, <clears throat> just trying to... Uh, narrow the picks down. I mean, Riley, you mentioned Jojo Rabbit. You guys mentioned Downton Abbey, which I'm unsure about just considering the fact that it is more of a TV movie than an actual film. Um, I do have Maggie Smith getting in, so I'm kind of splitting the difference. Um, you know, it's it's very hard to see, like, even if a movie gets three or four acting nominations, if it's going to be an ensemble, you know. So I would expect there to be some kind of maybe a, a little bit of all four of our predictions and then some other things that <laughs> that we're not even talking about right now. Um, okay, so we'll jump over to the best actress conversation where all four of us, uh, we all have, you know, Scarlett Johansson, we have Renee Zellweger, the front runners, but all four of us also have Lupita Nyong'o. And none of us uh, are actually predicting her for an Oscar nomination. So what's the difference here at SAG? Why do we think that she's going to be getting a nomination here and then coming up short uh, a couple months from now? Well, I think one of the main reasons why is because I have heard that the screener's gone out and was one of the first screeners to go out, the screener for us. And I think Us is another movie that did ex incredibly well at the box office, a movie that I've, everyone has seen because it came out in March. And Lupita Nyong'o also won for 12 Years a Slave, even though she hadn't, didn't win the Globe before that for that role. And um, I just think it's the type of performance they like to reward and the type of actress they like to reward, at least with a nomination. The reason why I don't have her, you know, getting in at the Oscars is because I don't think they'll be able to, or they won't, I don't I don't think they'll embrace that movie, even though they've been, you know, embrace Get Out. It's a tad bit different, and the reception wasn't as good. But I think Lupita is an incredible performance and deserves to at least be nominated here. I'll also say, you know, this is a movie that came out in February, and so I know that people have seen it. Um, unlike, uh, you know, I don't have uh, Charlize Theron or Saoirse Ronan in my predictions right now just because I know they're doing everything they can to have those movies be seen by people. But considering how tight the date crunch is this year, I don't know if it'll be enough, you know? So I'm looking at a movie like Us, which, you know, has already come out and, and been seen by the vast majority of voters, I'm assuming, um, as something that could get in there. Um, I don't have Lupita in my predictions at the Oscars right now, just because uh, I want to see how well she does on the circuit in general. Yeah. Like if she gets in at the Golden Globes, if she gets in at BAFTA, you know, she's probably, she could very easily get a Critics' Choice nomination because they have six slots. And I guess they also have that crazy horror <laughs> action actress thing. So um, <laughs> she could get in there as well. But I don't know. I think that, you know, uh, if it could be one of those things where like she just benefits from an earlier release date. Same thing with somebody like Julianne Moore and Gloria Bell, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, um, I could easily see her getting in as well. Right. Zach, why do you have uh, Alfred Woodard? Because her screener, it has gone out to SAG voters. Uh, they didn't get it at the time that voting had started though. Her film, I don't think has as much buzz as some of these other ones and it's not out in theaters right now. So why are you so confident in her? Well, I wouldn't say I'm confident in her. I think that, you know, Alfre Woodard is, you know, one of those actors, actors, right? I mean, she's been around for, you know, almost 40 years now. Um, and, you know, she really, uh, I don't want to call this a comeback necessarily, but this is like the best role she's had in a film in, in quite some time. You know, I mean, 
granted she was in 12 years of slave for like three minutes, but like, this is, mm -hmm. a, this is a substantial part. And, you know, she's, I think she's that kind of actor who, you know, SAG voters are going to want to reward, right. Um, for their years of service and the fact that like, they're finally getting some kind of like really juicy lead role after all this time. Um, I mean, you're right, Riley, the movie hasn't opened yet. Um, but it has at least been on the circuit since Sundance, right? Um, yeah. So they've been able to at least screen it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's not like a last ditch effort type thing, the way that Little Women or Bombshell is. Um, so I think her chances are about 70, 30, you know? I think she's helped by the fact that she just got an independent spirit and Gotham nominations, you know, so she's, more on their radar than some of these other people might be. Um, but I think that like, it's, you know, there, I, I feel more confident about her getting in than somebody like Saoirse or Charlize, who is, you know, they, they're really trying to get that film out in front of as much people uh, as they can at the very last minute, you know, right before people go off for Thanksgiving and Christmas. All right, Antonio, what do you think about this category? Um, the one, the one person I don't think we've talked about, um, is, uh, and I don't have her in my predictions yet, although I will probably put her in my predictions, is, uh, Cynthia Revo, uh, for mm -hmm. Harriet. You know, critics were, were certainly mixed on that film, but from what I'm hearing in terms of like, you know, voter screenings, you know, people are weeping, people are giving it a standing ovation, and Cynthia Revo has certainly had this kind of, uh, really in the last couple of years since she won the Tony for the color purple, she's had this kind of build, um, uh, in terms of, you know, some of her performances. And I think, you know, this kind of hits, uh, awards voters, Oscar voters more, but I think, uh, I could easily see her getting in. I agree about yeah. Lupita getting in. Um, also Lupita had that kind of viral, uh, moment where she basically kind of recreated this kind of us dance uh, mm -hmm. that was just all over the place. So I think, you know, I think Zellweger is definitely a, a lock to get in. I think um, Scarlett Johansson's a lock to get in. So I think it's a battle in those other three slots. And I think all the people we've talked about, including um, I think somebody like Aquafina, uh, who's, you know, gives kind of this revelatory performance in the farewell. I think she has a good shot of getting in as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got Cynthia Revo in. Her film is just, uh, it's a crowd pleaser. It has an A-plus cinema score, yeah. and it's already out, and they got the screener out early. So I feel like she has everything in her favor, and she's also apparently uh, campaigning. There's some chatter on the internet uh, about how, uh, how much she's you know, schmoozing uh, trying to get these nominations. So I think that's a good sign as well. Uh, so with that, we'll jump over to Best Actor. Uh, I'm the only one of us who has Jonathan Price instead of oh, Eddie yes. Murphy. Eddie Murphy is in Dolomite Is My Name. Jonathan Price is in The Two Popes. The Two Popes is written by Anthony McCartan, who previously did Bohemian Rhapsody, and he did Darkest Hour. So I feel like he is on a roll in terms of writing these uh, roles for... Uh, best Actor Candidates. Uh, Zach, I imagine you've seen the film. I'm not sure about the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me uh, what is missing here with Jonathan Price? Why is he not a slam dunk after Gary Oldman and uh, Rami Malek? Well, I mean, people are still catching up with the movie. I mean, like, this is uh, <laughs> this is the hardest category to predict because uh, by my count, yeah. there's about 10 or 11 people who could very easily get in. Right. Jonathan Price can very easily get in. Um, it's just a question of who do you take out? Right. Eddie Murphy seems like the most obvious one, but Eddie Murphy is campaigning his butt off for this. And, you know, he's in a movie that people love and people love him in it. So it's mm -hmm. like, do you take him out? Do you take Joaquin Phoenix out? Who's <laughs> everybody loves, but is in a movie that's a little more mixed. Do you take out Robert De Niro? Do you take out Adam Driver? Do you take out Antonio Banderas? Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is somebody who would be a lock in any other year, but he's in that like fifth, sixth, seventh spot. Taron Egerton is another person who could very easily get in. 
Adam Sandler, <laughs> who's oh, you know, going to win an Independent Spirit Award for Uncut Gems. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's a really tough category to call. And I think that everybody who's seen The Two Popes loves it, right? Um, it's just a question of have enough of have enough SAG voters seen it yet, right? Um, if they have, they could very easily vote for Jonathan Price to get in there. Um, but again, it's like, I don't know. Honestly, like any of the people who I just named, I would not be surprised to see nominated. And it would be a <laughs> shocking snub for anybody to to miss. You know, I mean, it's just a really tough category to call. Um, and that's that's the only reason why I don't have them in there is because I don't know who to take out. And, um, yeah. you know. <laughs> but I think you're you're right. He's probably you know he's probably going to get in, or who knows? Yeah, I I agree with Zach. I think this category is incredibly stacked. I think it's maybe even more competitive than uh, Best Actress. And for me personally, after Joaquin Phoenix and Adam Driver, I think anything can happen. I think those two are locked. I don't think they are missing. There's no. I can't imagine them missing. But after that, I currently do have Eddie Murphy, I have Leonardo DiCaprio, and I do have uh, Robert De Niro. But again, anyone could get in. Taron Edgerton could get in. Um, Jonathan Price could easily get in if the two if two pubs end up being uh, something that side voters really like. But my problem is as well that I'm not sure if they will be able to, or if enough voters will be able to see it. And Dolomite is my name came out of nowhere and exploded. I mean, everyone is talking about the movie. Eddie Murphy's receiving praise everywhere. And it's Eddie Murphy. So um, that's why I currently have him in. And I actually have him in third place. I think the movie, I, since I do have the movie in ensemble, I think it'll actually do quite well overall, which would put him a bit above Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro for me. And Tony? Yeah, I mean, I I don't really have anything different to say other than, you know, at this point, I think we're still in a place where we can, we have a little bit of time that this can move. I still have Antonio Banderas uh, instead mm -hmm. of DiCaprio um, after, after seeing Pain and Glory, which I just absolutely loved. And he gives, you know, certainly probably the quietest performance in this category. Uh, <laughs> But it is just a devastating uh, performance. It's the best thing he's ever done, at, uh, so much so that he won Best Actor at Cannes. Um, and so I, I can definitely be persuaded to move some other people, and I think there are really good arguments for people like Jonathan Price and Taron Edgerton, uh, and, and uh, I'm a little less on DiCaprio because I don't think people – look at Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and go, oh, yeah, that DiCaprio performance. And, you know, most people, when mm -hmm. that movie, they talk about Brad Pitt. Um, but I can see him getting in. So, I, you know, I think this one is just going to be a... I think we all agree that the, the automatics are probably uh, Phoenix and Driver. I think yeah. De Niro is, has a really strong... I think he's safe. -er. Um, but I, those last two slots, man... Um, but I think to not have Murphy in is a mistake because this is the this is really a comeback and Murphy yeah. is playing the game in ways that he's never played the game uh, before. I mean, he's even going to be on SNL uh, shortly. So I I just don't see when you compare Price and Murphy, which film is the bigger crowd pleaser? Which one just gets you applauding? And I think for a lot of people, that's Dolomite. Yeah. I think Dolomite just feels a little small to me for this year when it is such a competitive category. Uh, I do have DiCaprio because he's an A-lister, he's in a film that everybody saw, and I think maybe if this film had come out in a different year, I wouldn't be considering him, but since it's his first performance after winning the Oscar, I feel like people still are kind of riding that high uh, with him. Uh, but yeah, this is a category where I could see tons of people nominated. Uh, you guys mentioned Antonio Banderas. Uh, Pain and Glory is one of the two screeners that I have received this season. Mm -hmm. uh, made its way all, all the way up to Canada. Uh, so they are getting that film out there. I also got some uh, random documentary that I'm not sure will make the shortlist. I didn't watch it. I don't remember the title. 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it really differs from like Best Supporting Actress, which we'll talk about now, which is a category where oh. I feel like there are actually not a lot of people who really make sense. Uh, and the same with Supporting Actor as well, because with these SAG Awards, I try to just take out anybody who is in a December release and they haven't gotten their screener out. Um, so I've got Margot Robbie for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, yeah. even though she's barely in the movie, uh, just because I don't think that uh, voters will have seen Bombshell and um, you know they have seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So she has some visibility. I've also got Scarlett Johansson because I think Jojo Rabbit is actually going to be a big player uh, since it is such a crowd-pleasing film that it won Toronto, and it's got that uh, big ensemble cast. Uh, and Scarlett Johansson, you know, she's also in uh, Best Actress, and she might win that one, so why not give her another? And then I've got Down Abbey, Hustlers, and Marriage Story taking up uh, my other three slots for pretty much the same reasons as uh, in Ensemble. Right. I'm with you on Margot Robbie and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and not in, uh, <laughs> in Bombshell. I mean, because I think that, like, I know they've seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I have it winning Ensemble. So it just makes sense to me that they would put her in for that movie as opposed to Bombshell, which, again, like, I don't know if enough people have seen it. And even if they have seen it, you know, uh, I don't know how much about it I can talk about because the embargo doesn't lift until sometime in December. Um, but uh, I think Once Upon a Time in Hollywood's going to be a little bit of a bigger contender overall. Um, I, have, I think it'll uh, get into suspense as well. So it'll yeah, lead exactly. to nominations. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I have Maggie Smith in as well, even though I'm kind of 50-50 on Downton Abbey's chances. That could be the <laughs> the award that it gets for this. Um, I have Laura Dern in. I have uh, Jennifer Lopez in. Uh, and I also, I have Annette Bening in right now oh, wow. for the report. Um, although I could easily see that going to Scarlett Johansson for Jojo Rabbit. Um, it just... It it seems like on paper that should be an easy thing for Annette Bening to win for, um, but I don't know. It uh, I don't know how that movie's going to play overall. Um, you know, it's been out since Sundance. They've been screening the hell out of it. Um, you know, who knows? Uh, but I think that once you get past that, Sao Zhu Zhen could get in, but uh, I don't know. They tend to like to go for people who are in their guild. Um, you know, it, it kind of tapers off a little bit after there, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, there's not much that I can add. I pretty much agree with you guys. And I'm actually going to switch uh, Margot Robbie back to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood after you guys uh, mentioned that again. And I think that'll end up being her problem at the Oscars for the nomination is if voters can't decide between Bombshell and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, especially if she gets a Globe nomination for Bombshell, and then we could see some vote splitting, and that costs her the nomination in the end. I, I hope it doesn't happen, but there's a good chance. But I think she's getting in either for Bombshell or Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I don't think she misses. She even got in last year for Mary, Queen of Scots, and of course for Itania the year before. So I think she's definitely in. And except for that, I really do agree with everyone else. I think someone like Florence Pugh could still get in, but I don't, I'm not predicting the women to get into ensemble. Saoirse Ronan is not completely safe in Best Actress. And of course, the problem is, is that it doesn't come out until late December and the screeners haven't properly gone out yet. So I agree that it seems like a solid five to six people that are in the running. I don't have Annette Benning. Um, I had her at the beginning of the season at the Globes, SAG, and at the Oscars, but the report really hasn't made any waves, hasn't created any buzz. Uh, so I don't have that movie getting anything anywhere, to be honest. Yeah, I, and the only thing that I would kind of add, I mean, I'm going to keep Margot Robbie for Bombshell simply because she's so barely in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood that, you know, I, I maybe I'm giving the voters too much credit, but I just don't <laughs> see, I mean, I had my, I had numerous problems with that movie, but I don't see them, uh, Bombshell is certainly the more sympathetic performance, um, but I, I'm going to, and I'm also going to keep, keep, uh, uh, Zhao Zhuzhen. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Zach, am I saying that right? I, I think it's right. Yeah, Zhao Zhuzhen. Um, yeah, 
that that performance has struck a nerve with people. I mean, mm. she is she is getting nominations, you know, left and right, and she got in at the Spirit Awards, and 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 she's kind of this like just glowing light uh, that everybody is. Um, uh, Nine Nai, you you say Nine Nai to movie goers, and they know exactly who you're talking about. Um, so I, I'm going to keep her in until I have a really good reason to take her out. Yeah. I should add on, there was one person who I forgot to mention. Um, and since I'm putting this movie in ensemble and, and best actor, um, mm. I should bring up her name as well. And that is uh, divine joy Randolph for Dolomite yeah. is my name. Um, again, like I, I think it's an uphill climb for her, uh, but you know, she has been at every event that Eddie Murphy's been at. And, you know, just like uh, Zhao Zhuzhen for The Farewell, you know, she's the discovery of this movie, the, the one who people say, oh, wow, you know, I really loved her in this, you know, like, uh, such a such a discovery. So it wouldn't surprise me to see her taking up that fifth slot. Um, so maybe it's a tougher category than we're giving it <laughs> credit for. Um, and then even beyond that, we do also have... We should talk about her, and that's Meryl Streep, just because she is Meryl Streep. I don't think she's getting mm. in for either movie, but no. she, I don't think she's getting in. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> she's always a possibility. It is Meryl Streep for either The Laundromat or Little Women, but uh, The Laundromat was, the reception was terrible, and uh, I don't think her part in Little Women is big enough, uh, so I don't no. think she's getting in, but it's worth mentioning. It's just, she pops up when no one expects it. <laughs> okay, if if we're talking about Meryl Streep, I think it's time to move on to Best Supporting <laughs> Actor. <laughs> so I actually do not have the two guys from The Irishman. Oh, and yeah. Crazy. Oh, the cool. Irishman is uh, <laughs> it, it's a couple things. For one thing, like I said in Ensemble, I think that uh, it's it's too long. I don't think that it's going to be an easy sell for the uh, SAG nominating committee. They like more populist fare. And I think that these guys are also going to have the spotlight problem throughout the season where you can't mm. tell who's better. You know, some people prefer Al Pacino. I think more people do, but some people prefer Joe Pesci. And uh, they don't normally like to nominate multiple people from the same film. So I think they're actually just both going to miss. I think that won't be a problem later at the Oscars where it's a ranked ballot. But here where if you're just putting one or the other, um, I think that is not going to help them. I, I think, think that if you are, <laughs> <laughs> just I think if you are going to uh, base your predictions off this video, don't listen to what Riley's saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, this is not going to be like Spotlight. Spotlight was very subtle performances. This is going to be more like a three billboards type scenario. This is uh, going to be like with Woody Harrelson and Sam Rockwell both getting in. Um, Going into the movie, everyone was talking about Pacino, Pacino, Pacino. And then it's like, oh, my God, Pesci, too, right? Um, these are two legendary actors who have got their best roles in years. For, for Pesci, this is the first time he's been on movie screens in almost a decade. Um, they and Brad Pitt are pretty much locked in this category. It's those mm -hmm. last two slots that are going to be the difficult ones to fill. Um, honestly, you can just throw a dart. I have right now Tom Hanks. For a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Um, although we've seen Tom Hanks <laughs> come close <laughs> and miss many, many times this uh, century. Um, I also, in my fifth slot, I have Alan Alda right now for Marriage Story. Right. You know, he just won the Lifetime Achievement Award. He's going to be in a movie that could uh, potentially lead to nominations. Um, and, you know, he's the kind of person who, like, you know, working actor, long time in the industry, they might want to give, like, one last nod to. But having said that, I mean, like you look at Willem Dafoe in mm -hmm. The Lighthouse. That's uh, the I you look at Taika yeah. Waititi in Jojo Rabbit is a possibility. Um, you know, I mean, you just go on and on and on down the list here. Uh, there's a lot of people who could sneak into those last two slots. But if there's one thing for certain, <laughs> it's that both Pacino and Pesci mm -hmm. are getting in. And I do agree with you. I think they're probably going to split their vote, and uh, Brad Pitt could potentially win his first award for acting. I mean, his first uh, SAG award for acting, excuse me. Yeah, I just yeah. want to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick up on that. Um, I, I don't have Pesci in right now, 
um, because I'm, I'm, I'm still torn uh, because I think I think Defoe is a real uh, strong possibility in here. Um, but I mean, to not have Pacino, I mean, this is the best thing Pacino has done uh, in a really, really long time. And, and he's getting so much buzz for this. Um, I think Tom Hanks is getting in. Uh, <laughs> I think Tom Hanks actually has a real shot to win because he's like, oh, wow. I, th- I, th- I really do think he does because he's kind of like the, if you look at a lot of these performances, you know, Pacino, it's very, it's very, uh, it's loud and bombastic. It's also very funny. Uh, Brad Pitt is not exactly the, the warmest character in the world. I mean, with bashing people, women's heads against walls. Um, Defoe, The Lighthouse is a very dark movie, too, but Tom Hanks is Mr. Rogers. He is Mr. Rogers. I mean, it's just a warm, again, a warm hug of, of, of a performance. Um, but I, my fifth slot has uh, Anthony Hopkins right now, but I'm not mm-hmm. confident about that at all. Yeah. Um, I might switch out Hopkins for Pesci, uh, but Pacino for absolute sure is getting in. Can I just ask you guys really quickly? I don't mean to interrupt Luca before he has a chance to. No problem. Talk, <laughs> Let's but, hear it, Zach. Have you three guys seen The Irishman yet? No. Yes. No. Okay. All right. Pesci is 100% getting in. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> I just, like everybody loves Joe Pesci in this movie. That is, is just, it's a guaranteed lock it in. I mean, it would be a shocking snub if he were not to get in. Anyway, I see. Well, it, it will be a shocking snub. No, it will not be. It's <laughs> not. He is going to get in. He and Pacino will both get in. I'm telling you right now. This is like crazy talk. Anyway, I see the floor to Luke now. <laughs> I'll be happy to hear. I do have both in, even though I haven't seen the movie. But Smart this category, <laughs> this category is giving me a big headache because, as you said, I think. There are so many different possibilities, and I don't know who to put in those last two slots. I mean, currently, I'm going out on a limb, and there's really no reason why I'm doing it, but I have Jamie Foxx in there for just mercy. I know we're, as prognosticators, we have, you know, we consider stats and what's happened in the past and blah, 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 but sometimes it's just your gut that you have to listen to, and something like Jamie Foxx and just mercy is something that would happen at SAG and something I could see happening. That being said, I've had five million different people in that slot. I've had Anthony Hopkins there, but since I don't have Jonathan Price in lead actor, I don't feel comfortable having Anthony Hopkins in supporting actor. Then at one point I did have Alan Alda. I'm just not sure if Marriage Story is really going to get, so, you know, more than three acting nominations. Then at one point I had Willem Dafoe for The Lighthouse, but I'm not sure if The Lighthouse is going to be seen by enough SAG voters. And I could easily see Defoe going the uh, same path as last year for At Eternity's Gate, where he gets in at the Globes and then gets in at the Oscars. Um, it, it's just such a difficult category to predict, which is why for me, Brad Pitt is an easy front runner because this category is just a, a hot mess. And this is a performance people have been talking about since the movie came out. And there's so much goodwill for him. And then I do have the two Irishmen. Um, of course, I have Pacino and I have Pesci, and then I also do have Tom Hanks. Even though, as you said, Tom Hanks, uh, you can never be sure if he, he'll he'll really get in. And I don't know how that movie will do overall. But that last slot is very difficult. Someone I'm really intrigued by is uh, Shia LaBeouf in Honey Boy. Yeah. Now I don't think that the SAG nominating committee has screeners for that movie. But if they can get the screeners this week, I feel like uh, that's really compelling narrative where he you know, wrote and produced this movie about him you know, being an actor in the industry. Uh, Hollywood loves to vote for stories about itself. And uh, I could see him starting to make a run here. Uh, I do have Jamie Foxx for Just Mercy because Jamie Foxx, I feel like he's one of those, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, Maggie Smith kind of A-list types where he's going to get uh, or he's going to have an easier time getting a SAG nomination than an Oscar nomination. Uh, I feel like SAG is also uh, more socially conscious and they'll vote for films that kind of fit that agenda. Uh, And then I also have uh, Sam Rockwell for Jojo Rabbit. Uh, just because oh, wow. I had to, you know, fill the slots. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen Jojo run a bit. Uh, but he's not getting in for that, Riley. You're crazy. <laughs> I've seen the movie, I'm telling you. Yeah, and he also, 
Let's hear it, Zach. Uh, what kind of a role does he have in Jojo Rabbit? Because I figure, again, you know, Jojo Rabbit, big ensemble, big crowd pleaser. It's Sam Rockwell. He's been nominated a couple times in recent years, even one. Why not? Uh, because I think when people see that movie, their big takeaways from it are the children. Um, that's why I think Scarlett Johansson's a little bit iffy as well. I think that, you know, it's the kids who everyone focuses on in Jojo Rabbit. Sam Rockwell is good in the movie. I'm not trying to, you know, take away from that. And by the way, I mean, not for nothing, there is also like another much flashier supporting actor contender from Jojo Rabbit, the guy who's playing Adolf Hitler, Taika Waititi. Um, if they're going to nominate any supporting actor from this movie, it's going to be him. Like, um, I think Rockwell, it's not going to be, uh, it, it's not, it, it's not the kind of film where you're going to have like multiple supporting actor contenders because there is like one supporting actor contender from that movie. Uh, I'll yeah, just say like, yeah, you don't leave Jojo Rabbit going, <laughs> oh, wow, that Sam Rockwell performance. No, okay. you, go, you go talking about either the kids or Taika Waititi. Yeah, exactly. Continue. Continue. Thank you. And I, I will say this also. You know, there's a lot of names that we left out who could easily fill these five slots. You mentioned Shia LaBeouf. That's a really powerful performance. Um, I don't know if they're con campaigning Noah Jupe and supporting as well. That's my... Uh, my hesitancy with that uh, that uh, prediction. There's also Wesley Snipes and Dolomite. There's Song Kang Ho and Parasite. Um, you know, there's also Sterling College. K. Brown. Sterling, Sterling K. Brown. K. Brown. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. won a bag. So yeah. mm -hmm. my old college buddy Jonathan Majors from uh, mm -hmm. the last Black Man in San Francisco, who just got a Spirit nomination. So there's a lot of people. I mean, this is a really stacked category, and I don't think they're going to be just like filling slots in this one you know like if sam rockwell had a if, if it was a much uh, much less competitive year then maybe you'd have a case but like he's not the you know, he's very good in the movie but he is not the central takeaway from it he's maybe like the fourth or fifth thing you think about when you think about that movie so. and if bomb oh sorry did you no no go uh, ahead buddy yeah if uh, Bombshell, for example, does have a good morning when the nominations are announced, then John Lithgow could uh, easily get in for playing Roger Ailes. He won a SAG Award for The Crown for a supporting role in a category where lead and supporting actors uh, compete together. So that is a possibility if the movie does well overall and the voters did, you know, get the screeners on time. And as for Sam Rockwell, even though I don't think this movie is going to factor in at all, he will Ooh. also be on the ballot for Richard Jewell, as uh, Sam Rockwell will be. Wow, and yeah. I've heard a lot of good stuff about his performance in that movie. But since it's such a late breaking movie and no one's practiced or no one will have seen it by the time voting ends, I, I'm guessing, uh, I don't think it'll factor in it at all. At all. And as you say, I think Taika Waititi has the more buzzed about, gives a more buzzed about performance in that movie, and I don't see how Sam Rockwell stands a chance. He didn't even get nominated last year for Vice when um, Amy Adams and Christian Bale got in, so it's not like he gets in for every single performance he gives. I love the fact that if John Lithgow were nominated for playing Roger Ailes, oh, he could compete for another side, playing another fat, bald man, although it's a really <laughs> different fat, bald man. A much eviler one. One's in heaven, one's in hell for the night. <laughs>